Good. Now I'm going to reel. The next thing is actually kind of so the rest of the chapter, alternative definition uh, of operating cash flow in the equivalent annual costs. And then uh, we'll talk about real options real quick. All right. So the next is actually kind of interesting. And one thing I can say is sometimes it might be easier to, you know, you might, one thing when you're, when you're looking at these capital budgeting problems actually in a company is uh, you don't have, it's not necessarily like a textbook, so you may not have access to certain pieces of data or, you know, this is why I was mentioning the DuPont identity is actually sort of convenient because I can say something meaningful off of, you know, not too intricate data, right, just, just broadly total asset turnover, stuff like that. Uh, so um, it is nice at some extent to have different calculations of operating cash flow. So we define, you know, we, we have operating cash flow is equal to what? We've defined it in the past. EBITDA minus taxes plus depreciation. Yeah, so we have EBIT plus depreciation minus taxes. Now there's, there's a lot of different ways to get the same number. So we have sort of the top-down approach, the bottom-up approach, and the depreciation tax shift approach. So top down, top down approach, uh, sales minus cost minus taxes. Now the only thing to think about is it, this is just it's the same thing, it's just rewriting, it, right? Uh, can anyone see how we get from this? To this, so I know. Uh, sorry, and I shouldn't have this here. This is um, this is operating cash flow uh, under the top-down approach, right? So this is just this is how I calculated called the uh, the top-down approach. Right? So in other words, this is equal to that. I shouldn't have that top-down equal to. Uh, but can anyone see why these two things? Are, in other words, there's just rewriting the same thing. Um, uh, just you know, uh, other convenient ways of writing this. In other words, let me ask you: What is sales? What is sales minus cost equal to? Contribution. Sales minus cost is like uh, you know we've we've seen these in margins. But in other words, uh, is it anything like up here? EBITDA. It's EBIT, but uh, sales minus we to get EBIT we take sales minus cost minus what? Depreciation. So sales minus cost is just equal to EBIT plus depreciation. Does that make sense? So it's the same thing. This right here is just this equivalent to this. Let's just rewrite the same thing. We can also do uh, top bottom up. This might be a little bit more convenient. And then the last one is, is my personal favorite. Uh, but this is going to be net income plus depreciation. So if you have net income, you have depreciation, uh, you can back out operating cash flow. Of course, leaving out other, I'm, I'm not assuming other non-cash charges at this point, right? So to the extent that there are other non-cash charges, you would have to add those back in. But assuming that depreciation is our only non-cash charge, we can easily get operating cash flow by taking that income and adding back in our depreciation. Because what happens, uh, what is the, what is, what is EBIT minus taxes? If we're not including interest. Earnings. Yeah, and what's earnings? No. Another word for earnings? Net income. Net income. So in other words, I could just write it like this by saying EBIT minus taxes is net income. Add back, you know, so it's the same thing. The last one, depreciation tax shield. Uh, what is this? Sales, let me see, sales minus cost times one minus the tax rate plus depreciation times the tax rate. Is that what it is? Is that my tax shield approach? Of course, we can figure this out fairly easily if it's not. Yes, that's it. That's it? Mm -hmm. 
So now the question is, maybe I should leave this to you. Uh, is this, you know, can you show that this is equivalent to this? Do you think it's equivalent to that? So now the question is showing. Oh. Should I leave this to you and like maybe bonus points if you show up? Yeah. It's just a little bit about, I mean, multiply this out and rearrange them. And then you just kind of have to notice what's, you know, what's what. It might be really convenient. Well, yeah. See, I can see. Let me think about this for one second. If I get that. Good. Yeah. It shouldn't take you too long. I'm just looking at this going, okay, well, if I, have, if I multiply this across, uh, I might be able to arrange it in such a way that I have sales minus um, costs. I might be able to get net income. Well, anyway, I'll leave this. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's uh, simply a matter of multiplying that through. Or do you want me to do it now? Bonus. Try. Okay, you try. Like the last time. Um, good. So now the reason why I say, of course, this is nice, is it just shows um, the proportion of our operating cash flow, which is due to our depreciation tax yield. So in other words, this is called the depreciation tax yield approach. There's your depreciation tax yield, meaning this is what the depreciation saves me in tax, depreciation times the tax rate. Um, so good. Now the last thing, so we're okay with this? I, there might be a, a quick little exam question going on where you'll have to say, you know, uh, I might give you something to easily calculate by depreciation tax rate or so forth. So maybe something on the exam. Uh, maybe not. But the last thing to talk about in this chapter will definitely, well, historically has definitely been on the exam. Um, uh, we need to look at how to decide when, when we're going to replace uh, a machine, like, the, you know, a cost-saving machine, uh, and the two options have different lives. So, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Equivalent annual cost map. So the idea here is, I'll go through. I'll go through a brief example, like the text does. We have to uh, choose between two machines with different lifespans. So in other words, um, uh, these are going to be costs. So let's say we have uh, two machines. We have machine A and machine B. Uh, at time zero, each one costs. You know, these these are all going to be costs. So we want these to be lower, right? So these uh, these are costs. This one costs 500. This one costs 600. Um, then we have okay, time one, two, three, uh, 120, 120, 120, uh, 100, 100, 100. Uh, uh, let me say four. So the idea here is that now the machines, well, there's a couple of assumptions we have to make. You know, these are the, the machines, of course, they're going to be equally effective, right? Now, um, and these are going to be important, uh, important assumptions, but the big assumption that we're going to make here is that we can replace the machine uh, for the same real cost uh, uh, at the end of its life. Does that make sense? So this, this is, I have to say, the big assumption, meaning we have two unequal lives. So the assumption we're going to have to make is that I can replace this machine for the same amount in year four. And I can replace this machine for the same amount in your, you know. For, so in other words, what I can do is sit there and say, okay, uh, well, um, you know, uh, I can just extend these cash flows out, rebuy a new machine, and have new cash flows. Does that make sense? Technically, I would have to say, okay, buy another machine here, 500, then have 120, 120, 120. Right? Buy another machine here, 600, 100, 100, 100, going off. Now. Um, the idea here is we make an assumption that uh, uh, we're dealing in real dollars, not nominal dollars. So, uh, but um, 
but that still is, is you know, sort of an important assumption that goes into this. So the question is, how, how do we decide which machine to buy, if we can make that assumption? This is obviously more money. It's uh, fewer years, and it's uh, less upfront cost. More upfront cost, more money, uh, or less money, but for more years. So we need a sort of a methodology to, to decide which project to, to um, or which uh, machine to buy. So it's a cash outflow and then inflows. These are all cash outflows. It's like a machine, like a computer. Um, you know, they think of it like a, I don't know, a truck. You buy it and then you, it has some operating cost uh, every year. So this is, you know, the purchase price and operating cost every year. So if this was, yeah, here's the thing, and, and we also have a discount rate, uh, uh, we have a discount rate. So, um, you know, the discount rate, I don't know, 10%. Now the idea here is if we could do this, then it would be easy. We just discount them both back and see which one is less and choose that one. Does that make sense? But we need somehow to account for the fact that these have two different lives. So what we need to do is we need to put these on annual terms, the cost per year. So I need to turn this machine A into a cost per year, machine B into a cost per year. And then I can just say, that's my cost every year. And assuming I can replace it at the same amount, that's my cost in year three, four, five, six going on, right? And, you know, da, 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 da. So we need to, to change this to a cost per year. Is there any way where we could take some lump sum and, and put it into a, a fixed uh, cost per year? Um, uh, the same amount every year for a set number of years. Is that kind of like an annuity? Perfect, right? So that's a cash flow and an annuity. So when I say uh, uh, set amount per, uh, uh, equal amount per year for a fixed number of years, that's an annuity. So, uh, yeah, all we have to do is, is sort of turn these into annuity payments. So the first thing we do is get the lump sum. So we can find uh, the present value of A and the present value of B at 10%. Right? So, um, uh, I have the numbers here, so we don't actually have to go through and calculate this. But if we just, again, just discounting these cash flows, we'll find the present value at time zero, right? So present value T equals zero is equal to uh, 798.42. This is the present value of, you know, this is, um, I'll just say A over here. B over here, the present value at time zero is equal to 916. 916.99. Now the idea here is um, just because B has a higher present value doesn't mean it's worse because again B uh, goes for more years than A does. Right? So now we need to, to treat this as the present value of an annuity and find the annuity payment out for, for, uh, for A out three years and for B out four years. Does that make sense? So we sit there and say okay uh, well, our annuity formula, what was that? That was the present value of an annuity equals uh, 1 minus 1 divided by 1 plus R to the you know, N number of periods divided by R, uh, C. This is times the annuity cash flow. Is that our? So what, all we need to do is, uh, and I'm going to just erase this stuff up here, rearrange this and solve for the cash flow. So we sit there and say, okay, well the cash flow per period, per year, is going to be equal to, the, you know, uh, all of you know how to do this. You did it. I actually had two questions on the exam which used this. So um, we need to solve for this. So all we do is plug in for A, um, uh, present value, uh, uh, 798 with our discount rate, 1 minus, uh, now the only thing to make sure is we use three years here for A and four years for B. Don't use the same number of years. Does that make sense? So easy, again, 10% um, discount rate, I'll just put the answer here for A. That's going to be um, the equivalent annual cost, so for A and B, Equivalent annual cost for A is going to be, and you can confirm this, a 321.05, and for B, 289.28. So 
So, given that these are costs, choose B. Is that okay? Sounds like an alien. Sounds like, I think it's the, uh, oh, it's the fan on this podium system. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I don't even know uh, to the extent that that's working, um, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this, you know, this is, I, I'm asked, I don't know the philosophy on the exam, but uh, this is, you know, sort of a likely exam question for this. Does this make sense? Yep. So all you need to do is, but again, oh, uh, uh, what I, if I haven't asked this computation on the exam, what I have often asked is what assumption does this make? And again, this has the assumption that you can repurchase it for the same price. Is that a great assumption? No, you know, it depends. It's probably, you know, maybe for small things with short lives, it's maybe an okay assumption. Uh, particularly once you get starting to get to big costs and, you know, lives that may be over 10 years, then that's not a, it's not a super assumption. Uh, so uh, I might ask, you know, just assumptions that go around this. So look at the calculation and make sure you read what are some of the assumptions that go in. Um, the next section. So this is the end of uh, chapter, uh, the end of chapter six, and uh, out of chapter seven, I only cover one topic, and that's real options. Now I cover. So let me talk a little bit about real options, and then we'll stop. We'll do a couple concept questions, and then we'll go through end of chapter problems. Now, how can I frame this? Like, let's go back, you know.